<laughs> so um, there aren't so there are some non-obvious parallels to working with Bob over the internet during COVID to being thrown in the street with wedding bands, being jostled. I mean, I got hit by motorcycle uh, handlebars probably four or five times running around after wedding bands. And I didn't even think about it. I just was loving it. So there's, there's something about the immediacy of it and a certain amount of risk. So I suppose for Bob to go that far, he's putting himself at some psychological risk. Fair? Maybe not. I don't know. He's, he's happy with it. Um, but there's something about the immediacy of responding to that stuff that's a lot like responding to the immediacy of what's going on in the street right in front of you. And so doing the music for that, and most of the video editing was Bob's. And I, actually, I really like the way the thing develops and that thing, images that might be disturbing, isolated on their own, become a relief from the role of the thing. So uh, I, haven't, I haven't watched it for a year, but I thought, let's, let's start at the top, or the bottom, as it may be, with this kind of stuff, to then work to talk about the, the wedding band project. Because I think there are those connections that are real, and the pressures of COVID were pretty brutal, and I got a ton of work done, and it was a way of responding to that and being in the street with COVID in a way, even though you're stuck in your studio and working with uh, stuff like this. Brian and I did some work uh, online too, where we trade files and we even like cheated on a, a uh, festival where we pretended we were streaming, but we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it was in Germany, so we felt it was okay. Um, so now to the wedding bands. The way I got interested was we showed up in India in 2009, because Wendy, uh, my wife, had a Fulbright to learn to study ECOT weaving. And ECOT weaving is not very accessible because it's kind of a closely held family secret in most situations. So we're, we went to Gujarat, and I think, as it turns out, they, they, uh, I think they picked MSU because they, they uh, charged Fulbright less. But it turns out it's a, really a good place because it's close to a lot of ECOT. And it's ended up being like a second home to us because we've now lived there four times on the same street in three different apartments. And uh, we get there, and one of the first few nights we're out, we're, it, wedding season had started. So we're on a street, and the fireworks start going up. And we turn, and up, coming up the street at a, at a wedding band cart, huge echo on the voice. Wah, 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 wah. And uh, a marching band that, to me, looked like they were dressed in Sergeant Pepper uniforms. And it's like, you know, it reminded me of the time when we were out walking around in this little temple district that's across the street from us by the zoo. And I encounter a donkey that has pink circles painted on it. And it's like, what, have I just entered Alice in Wonderland? It was one of those moments where... Uh, something that felt like magic happened, and it really did feel like that. And it wasn't just the surprise of it, it was like a genuine appeal for the combination of the sounds. So the fireworks, with the people dancing, with, uh, in that case, I, I can't remember the specifics of that band, because I've heard great wedding bands, and I heard one, which closes out what you're gonna see, which may be the worst band of any kind I've ever heard, anywhere in the world. <laughs> and and the, the surprise of that is really bad bands can make great sound design because when it's a team with an image, it, it works. But I saw it and I was just intoxicated by it. And I was, I, I was just kind of a tag along for this and I didn't really know what to do with India. And the thing I did wrong was thinking it will just provide because there's so much going on. And nothing just provides, for, at least with a personality like mine, I've got to be working on something and engaged in a project. And I, the first time around, I had, had trouble finding that. So I, I kind of struggled with it, but I was unknowingly discovering things that really grabbed my interest and still hold my interest 
like, I'm glad that I'm going to get to see some uh, wedding bands in the street, and I'm going to do the same thing as I did seven years ago and chase them around and when they start up in Gujarat when we get back. I still love that. So what happened was <clears throat> we went to the Fulbright Conference at the end of, well, toward the end of our stay, and the, the head guy says, and I don't have a terminal degree. I have a master's degree in creative writing. I didn't bother with an MFA program because I wanted to live in San Francisco because of the writing scene there. And I felt that was more valuable to me than the credential because I knew too many professors growing up and I didn't want to be one. And uh, turned out I ended up teaching anyway for 25 years, but that, who knows what's going to happen. But he said professionals can apply. So I, th I kept thinking about those wedding bands a couple years later. I looked into it. There was only one book, very little coverage on video. Nobody had done much with it. And it's this, I mean, you can put a hierarchy on the quality of the musicianship if you want to, but the quality of the experience is undeniable. It's, uh, to me, re just really powerful and, and a beautiful thing. So I, um, I do recommend going to school in creative writing because then you learn to do voices. So I, I uh, put on my academic voice and wrote the proposal for the Fulbright and uh, got it. You know, I referred to the right current books on ethnomusicology and my stance toward the music and I, I got the project. So I got here and uh, as soon as the wedding band started up, it was just like it was like a, a party. We'd, we'd, we'd drive around in rickshaws trying to find wedding bands. You know, we'd listen for them, and we'd try to track them down and get in there and just mix in with them. And along with this, there was a series of interviews, which won't show up on here, with the people that were in the wedding. Well, there is one that's on here, one of my favorites, but with the people that own the wedding band uh, companies and uh, what, the, what they'd gone through, all of that. So um, that's how it got going. And no regrets. I, I loved the action of that project. As far as the equipment goes, so at, at, I I bought a I bought a Voigtlander, a 25 millimeter for micro four thirds, which which uh, converts to 50, so it's like natural vision, and it opened to 0.95, so basically. I, I could, I, if I wanted to, I could read a book in the dark with it, almost. I mean, it worked really well, and the imagery is beautiful. And I shot that most of the time. Ben was second camera, and he is, uh, and I was shooting a, what, a, a GH3, which was the best Lumix then. What were you shooting? G6? I don't remember. G6, I think. And we had, an, uh, what was it, 80 millimeter? Um, what, what, what brand was that? An 80, a decent 80 millimeter lens, which I'd seen because one of the first people to shoot a, a, a feature film with, with micro four thirds had used the same lens, so I thought, that, that's good enough. Anyway, it worked out fine, so basically all, all the imagery is on those two. And for audio, I used a preamp with, uh, with the Air, uh, what, Sound Man by Gnarl. And so all the sound was recorded Virtually all the sound you hear was with binaural stuff, and I had brought good recorders with me too, and nice Audio Technica mics. But it was so much easier and so much unobtrusive to look like you're just, you know, you're listening to. Uh, I guess it wouldn't be NPR here, <laughs> some old Bollywood music on your headphones when you're actually recording whatever's going on, and that worked. That mixed out pretty well for the film. So. The first piece I think that shows up here of the wedding band films was a piece of luck because we were in a weaving village and there was a wedding going on and it was an all percussion band and the, the main player is an incredible player. So I'll, I'll, I'll play this next. Also, stop me if I'm getting off the tracks that you guys are interested in. And, ask, and if you have questions, ask those too. So that's the end of the corona section of the evening, or the afternoon. Is this in the way?
we've gone from Surinder to Jodhpur.
is on. I want to know how long has he been playing in the band? How long has he been playing in the band? I like it that the, the wind player looks like a Muslim Lou Reed, but apparently as a bit of humor doesn't play very well to this room, but I think it's funny. He's one of six left playing that instrument. It's in Budge.
So those are the clips. Uh, where I went wrong was liking things too much. So there was really no reason to have the uh, musicians in the kind of, what, what color is that room? Chartreuse? I don't know. Uh, the, the guy with the, the double reed and the, the percussion player, by the way, who I interviewed, it was maybe one of the most boring people I've ever met. He couldn't stop talking. Like, ah. Uh, but I loved it that he, was, that he had a ring on his finger that he was using to, to play the tin. So my own interests overwhelmed bit my better judgment on the length of, of that shot. And uh, it didn't deserve that much time. But it was out of passion, so uh, since these are just, it's not finished, I'll, I'll uh, not feel too bad about showing it to you because it was a way to talk about it. Because I mean, part of what I want to talk about is that every bit of that was passion driven. And every bit of that was because I was loving what was happening in those moments and attending to them as closely as I could. I mean, involved in it. It was intoxicating almost. So that it was almost a hypnotic type experience and uh, zero regrets and so much luck involved too in finding some of those spots and I guess which was the worst band in the world anybody of that group no <laughs> really <laughs> those last guys couldn't play at all <laughs> I mean literally they couldn't play the drummer, he wasn't even listening. He was just kind of doing this. And the, and the singer had the echo turned all the way up. And that poor guy with the trumpet had to pour water in it about every 30 seconds to get anything out of it. It was, I mean, I felt sorry for him, but also I was, once the procession was going, I realized, God, this, this works. It's, it's, it's enough. And, and it's uh, ended up, once it's been transfigured by being recorded, it turns into something else. So the experience of it, I mean, I think that ended up being good sound design from rotten music. And uh, I learned a big, a big bunch from that. I mean, it would have been easy to see how these guys were playing and think, well, this isn't going to be worth it. Let's go back and, and eat dinner. But we stuck with it, and uh, the experiences were good. A couple more technical points. I used, when, when did uh, Bias go out of business? Or when did they quit? They just quit. Anybody remember, was that 20, was it before 2015? I used either Bias or uh, Isotope to clean that up. So I cleaned everything up. And if I were you guys, I'd buy those uh, light versions of Bias when they come out as a package deal. Because then you can do almost everything audio wise and it won't cost you much money at all. Those, those, and, if, and if you can afford the, the larger packages, do that, because they're super. I know Brian, he just popped for the giant. And uh, I was lucky enough to get be part of a, consumer, a marketing interview in which they gave me a $500 credit a year ago or two years ago. So I, I got a bunch of stuff that I, I had some of their stuff obviously before, but I got some more. But that, those products may, sound recorded like that, pretty manageable. And listening to it from this point of view, it was fun to hear when it wasn't just a recording of a band, but when it became more sound design, because the more traffic there was and the more interfering sounds there were, in some ways the richer it was. And I think that that aspect of it's important to think about too, and to not worry too much about getting all that out, of, get, getting that out of there. What you want to get out of there is like dry cough. <laughs> Certainly, other like if you are doing, you're getting some like some fabric noise off of you, things like that. And I know not everybody likes binaural, but I really had no problem making it work as stereo for this. Um, and I was I was completely pleased with the sound. And those were at that point 15 year old. Soundman mics that I picked up in Germany on the way to Tajikistan to, to teach creative problem solving. That sounds like a good sentence, doesn't it? I wish I had film of that. That was really fun too. Um, 
So you've got why I did it. Certainly why, where I screwed up. I, the, the, the piece that was developing before I stopped working on it was a little too much of my, my, family, my family vacation with high-tech equipment and certain obsessions. And I, was, uh, I got off base thematically. So I had footage of crocodiles and uh, Sufi, I got invited to some Sufi piercing ceremonies, so I got to have, you know, I, if, if they had cleaned those spikes up, I would have done this one, but they don't, so I didn't, I decided I'd avoid hepatitis. But I, you know, I got to see these piercings and uh, a couple people getting their tongues pierced together and dancing. Yeah, it's so tempting to include all of that because it's so interesting, but it's like, if something is so interesting, it deserves its own paragraph, or its own le its own essay, or its own novel, wh whatever it uh, develops into. So I got seduced by this variety of interests that I have, and the luck that I had in having these encounters, to uh, mixing it up a little too much. This was mostly pretty good, though I really shouldn't have included the guys with the, the double flute and the and the drum. Otherwise, every, everything fits. That was okay. And uh, I don't feel like the humor was condescending with the, with the uh, guys who were genuinely funny. I mean, I ran into the, years later I ran into the guy who uh, tried to leave the screen. And he was, he was real excited to see me. He, he had a good time that day. Um, so this brings back great memories for me, which means nothing to you as viewers. Now I want to hear back from you about these pieces of something which can be a finished whole, because I still have, I mean, I have weeks of footage. And I have great interviews. For instance, the good clarinet player, that, you, know, the, you know the band with the dynamic drummer who looked like he should be, in the, like, he should be like the, the Bombay Elvis, this guy? Um, the clarinet player in there, was a, he was a serious musician. He was really good, and he, he talked a lot about his disappointment in not being, in, he had to quit music school at MSU to support his family, so he did this instead. And he, he's recorded quite a bit, but he just didn't get to live the music life that he wanted to. So I've got a really great interview about that, which would be a fitting piece of the movie. I've got a parallel interview with the band, did you notice the one that had Udaipur on the side? And it had to get and it had to this guy. That the guy that runs that is an incredible musician from a musical family. His father played in fifty countries. This that wedding cart had a violin seat inside the cart, and his son was playing electric violin. And these guys could play. And they had like maybe I think twelve different sets basically. So they had uniforms and setups for twelve different kinds of performances. And they, one of them was hap happened to be the, where I got grabbed into the ring and the sweaty guy was dancing with me. That was, that was the nastiest hug I've ever experienced in my life. It's like, oh. And, 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 and a, a side story, uh, the conditions were, we could tell were deteriorating. So we knew something was going to happen because some of those guys were really drunk. So we said, look, we got to get out of here because something's going to happen and we don't really want to be part of it. And it turns out, something did. Uh, the driver of one of the vehicles backed into the uncle of the bride and knocked him down. <laughs> and the uncle of the bride, was he was Jane, but he slapped the guy anyway. <laughs> and I thought, I, wish I, I do wish we'd stayed <laughs> if I'd known it would have been that manageable. But uh, these stories that go with it are probably worth asides to tell the story because this is... And I tried to keep it personal because you know it's bed in there where he turned and took a, a photo of a person taking a photo of him, which is one of the routines we do. So like when strangers ask for a picture of me, I say, okay, 10 rupees. <laughs> so it's part of this, this approach. Um, but I think in a movie like this, it's important to keep us in there because we're in there. And you know, people aren't behaving the way they would if we weren't there. They're, they're close, but they're also a little bit more gets directed towards us or, or away, depending on the self-consciousness. Um, 
And I'm, I think I might finish it. I, I, there's a lot more there, and I, I, and I love this. I love it, so I think I should finish it. So, so talk to me. Well, Guj Gujarat, because that's where we were located. <clears throat> and there was a lot going on right then. But we also spent some time in, in Udaipur, which was, was the best and worst bands were there. So that was... And I was just wondering, you know, you said you were going to Oh, okay. Did, the question was that I just responded to, did we just focus on Gujarat? And in terms of you said, you, you know, in your proposal, you... Well, my position was that this is a vanishing form. It's being, you know, even then you could tell it was being edged out by uh, big speakers and, and DJs. And my unspoken position was that I just, I loved it. Um, and I think that's got to be there too, because if you just go from a formal position, I, I didn't repeat the question. The question was about my, the position that I put forward in the in my proposal. So it was it was about capturing this form before it went away, and my rationale was that it's super underrecorded. I think that was even in the title. It just hasn't. Nobody's paid much attention to it. The one book that's written about it describes the wedding bands as the garbage men of Indian ritual music, and it's like. I love the smell of that garbage, you know. I, I, I wanted to get that, so I got as much of it as I could. And then back, then, then as I was editing, I lost track of, of, my, of my goal, and uh, I ended up wanting to make more of kind of a, a, a video tone poem about the experiences, and there, some of those scenes in there do that pretty well, I think. Um, the guys, these guys, I, I love this. They're they're combing their hair for us, and uh, and of course the the uh, some of those images like where the guy turns and his his tuba doesn't have a mouthpiece, so he's just a prop. I I love that, and there are a couple others. So that's potential, and I could do a short one of those, twelve minutes. I don't know. That'd be pretty interesting, but I think the valuable thing to do would be to complete it with my original intentions and include the interviews. And if I get lucky and have enough time in the next month, go back and catch up with some of these same people. But I still know where they are. I can easily get in touch with them. Um, and uh, you know that, that one scene where they're playing that pretty high class music in the street, where they're playing really well together and those guys all have technique. The, one of the saxophone players I had gotten to know, and he came over and we did a couple of sessions together. And I wish I'd done video of that. This was really interesting. And it fits how the, how the music fits together. Um, my friend Shirag, who you see walking with my daughter in one of those last scenes, um, is a, like a super percussionist. So he was playing electronic drums, I was playing bass, and Arvind was playing saxophone. And Arvind originally wanted to be a guitar player, and he loved, but like that, actually some of the same stuff I love, which is that noir sounding Bollywood music from the 60s, right around 1960. He, he loves that stuff. So I said, well, play, play when you really like. So he played it. And I said, well, okay, let's stick with that scale, and we'll improvise. And he played the same thing over again. <laughs> and so Chirag and I, Hit it, found a groove and played it. And then I said, well, let's try it again. But this, this time, play from the scale. And he played the song again. And we, t we picked a different groove. So we ended up with him playing basically the same thing maybe four times, and, and Shirag and I playing these different grooves. And without asking the question, you guys learned to improvise, I found out. But it was, it was fascinating. And they all sound good, you know. Uh, but it was just a different approach. And it turns out he loved guitar more than saxophone, but couldn't find work. So when we left, I gave him my guitar. I, I would buy a guitar when I come to India so I'd have one to play. So he, he has, well, by now, the neck's probably like this because of the 
humidity, but it works pretty well when I give it to him. I wish I had that on there. I think that would be a decent fit. Questions? Other questions? What was the make of my guitar? I think it was a Gibson. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, did, I saw one at the flea market that literally the neck was like this. And I wanted to buy it just to have it and, and, and have it in my house and look at it for a while and then leave it on the curb somewhere. It didn't. It does sound good. And actually the fretboard came off and I, I, I got some glue and some clamps and I used the railing of my, of my balcony as a, as a straight edge and I clamped it overnight and it held up the rest of the time. It was fine. Uh, is there a, you mentioned that there's a hierarchy of quality, however you define quality. Yeah. Um, how does that work? Does, does it mean that a richer band that can afford more instruments has a better quality again how how does quality work? Okay, did this get you? So yeah. the question, how does quality work? What is it what does it mean in this context? And the partial answer is that what I discovered from the experience was Quality is how it functions and what the final product is. So what I thought was the lowest quality band ended up being what I thought was beautiful sound design for the setting. Going down the street and ending with that sign that says hint and points off to the side. It's like I took the hint from that. Uh, the quality, as I would, like if I, and I auditioned those musicians in a room down here, I would think, oh, sorry guys. But for that, they were perfect. So what the quality is, I think, always relative to, to what your context is and what the goal of the piece is. And the, the, the good clarinet player that I talked about, I think his bitterness comes through a bit in his, in his energy. He really does know, his, one of his talents is how to select mu musicians. Like that particular drummer was, made, was one of the better musicians in the, in the whole thing. He was great. And in that way, it, work, but when it shifted over to his clarinet playing, I felt like it cooled off too much and that it, it lost energy. And so where's the quality there? Here's somebody that can play better than the other people in his band, but when he plays, it's worse because it doesn't have the energy that that, that job requires. So I mean, the quality is always relative. And I, I'm not one to believe that there's no point in talking about quality because I don't think everything's equal. And, I, and the people that I know who have talked like that, when they select people, they're not, they're, not talking what, they're not talking what they've said either. They're not playing the game they've described. So, but I think there's a big range of what can work and it really depends on, on how things work together. That's why collaboration is so important. You fill in each other's holes, um, you give each other ideas. Yeah, question. Um, For the wedding band players, can, can this be a livelihood for the for the wedding band musicians? No, it's always a side thing. So, like uh, regarding the quality of the instruments, there's a really good saxophone player that uh, was in the same band as the guy that tried to escape the the film. And he, I mean, that guy, he was just hired to, to dance around and, and kind of be a, a uh, energy provider. But the saxophone player was really good and his uh, springs were gone and he was using rubber bands for his valves. And now I wish I'd brought along a box of replacement springs and, and found that guy. I think he was from out by Padra near, uh, near Baroda. So he was a good musician. His equipment was terrible. And he made his he made his living as an onion farmer, and that had been a good year for onions. So he was he was happy, and he also loved playing music. It's funny; it's like a lot of us. I've never made a living from playing music. I've I've sometimes made money from playing music, and courtesy of the Fulbright Nehru Association, I'm making money from exploring music and making instruments right now, 
and that's happened periodically in my life. But to do like a commercial enterprise, which I think you're asking, that's hard all, everywhere, unless you're a star, or, uh, or, you, or you give it all up and you just do something you can't really stand. So, but short answer. I mean, anybody else want to throw in on this? But uh, in terms of if you were having a wedding, what, what, what would be your markers for hiring a band? Is it word of mouth? Some bands are good. Well, that's a good question. If I had access to some of these bands, I would pick the one with the most energy. I wouldn't pick the one with the best players. I'd probably pick one where the players were good enough and then they had that certain spark, that, that thing that happens. And having just played in a wedding, my marker, of course, in that case is the top quality, with, with me playing guitar. You know. I played for my daughter's wedding and, and my ex-wife and her husband and uh, my brother-in-law played. So, a little, little joke. But yeah, I, I, would, I wouldn't go for pure musicianship. Uh, when, when my wife Wendy and I got married, we, her mom gave us some cash to spend, so we spent most of it on a band, a jazz band from Kansas City, and the saxophone player was named Aladdin, and he was one of Charlie Parker's teachers. So, and he was playing with a bunch of young guys that were all good jazz players. Wow, that was a wedding band, because they had all of it. Because they had the energy, and they could play. It was really fun. Didn't you think? Yeah. I wish I could remember more of it. But. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, is this the, like, uh, the kind of wedding band that you're highlighting is, um, and your trip? Are they the, the primary type of wedding band that you would find, or is it just a certain class of you know, trying to oh. They're traditionally. Oh, is it, so the wedding, the question is, is I keep forgetting, the, the wedding bands that I'm highlighting in, in this set of clips, are they the typical wedding band or are they just one out of a, of a range of wedding bands? That like, they, is there like, are these primarily street performer in sort of like their kind of uh, ranking and like the okay. music? Right. So the question basically is there a range of wedding bands that includes professional musicians that play all the time? And are are the and are these that I was focusing on just uh, street oriented, basically? And I'll get back to that question about what's happening in the States. There's one, there's one called Red Barat in, uh, I think out of Brooklyn, that has a really good uh, doll player that I've been in, a little bit in touch with. Okay, so the, this particular kind of wedding band traditionally takes the, bride, the, the groom to the wedding site, and they are not invited inside the wedding ground. So they're this calling them the, the garbage men of Indian ritual music. It's kind of apt because they're excluded and they're not treated very, very well. And uh, they're only on the street. They don't get invited in. So regarding here in India, at least the part of India that I filmed in and I'm familiar with, that's how it goes. But then there are these, the stuff has evolved. So that in Udaipur, I think that this group does all kinds of stuff. And they probably do some parallel things to what you're talking about that happens like in the Bay Area and in the New York area where you've got professional musicians, some of whom have come from India and some who, who didn't, who are playing uh, cleaned up versions of this music that has more improvisation in it and more, more jazzy-like flourishes maybe and more kind of R&B flourishes. Yeah. And they're, they're, they could be used anywhere for these wedding parties. And like Red Barat, I know, 
from Brooklyn plays a bunch of festivals. Yeah. Yeah, and I do, I'm, I'm guessing they invite them in in the States, though I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> they probably pay quite a bit of money. And they would have to pay a lot of money to get these guys to play, because these are, these are top-end people. Are we done? I believe these guys are starving. Are you starving? <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, also, they have this... I know. I know. Someone steals it. Someone steals it? The wedding band guys sneak in and steal the lunch. So, uh, any other questions? So, maybe you can meet Sydney and Scotland.